All right. Well, good morning. So I got a chance to get away for a couple Sundays. Um, so if you've been here for the first time over the past few weeks, I've not got a chance to connect with you yet. So welcome to Eastern Hills. And then if today's your first Sunday, you picked a great Sunday to be here. I think you're going to enjoy today's message. You can find it helpful and hopeful. But we also have a whole group of people that are joining us at home online. So let's welcome them. Thanks for being a part of today's service today. A couple weeks ago, you got to hear from a guest speaker, um, Patrick Linnell did a great job, and then also Wendell Fall stepped in on a quick pivot last week, so I want to say thanks to Wendell and thanks for Pat. You both did a great job the past few Sundays. You know, as a church, one of the things that we experience in real time is life happens, you know, and sometimes you have things planned, we have our plans, and then God has his plans. Uh, so we had some content that was planned through this series that we called Grace Bomb, and after spending some time in prayer, seeking counsel through some of our team and our board of elders collectively at I think there was wisdom in saying, hey, this is an effective tool, but maybe just not right now in this season, so let's bring it back at a later time. So next week, we're going to kick off a new series that I'm excited about. It's called Before You Quit. It's a series on perseverance. It just seems like there's one thing coming at us after another in the world, and so why should we continue to do good? God's Word has a lot to say about that, but today, I want to zero in on something that the Apostle Paul said years ago. He said this, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. So instead, if you have your Bibles open, you're following, you might circle that instead as a reference to everything. Here's one scenario is that we're deceived. We believe things that are true. We believe things that lead us down a, a path that's the opposite of God's best for our lives. So that's one approach is to be deceived. And an alternative approach is this idea of speaking the truth in love, that the things that we're believing that are, that are not true about us, others, or God, that we would be set free from those lives so that we would grow to be Come in every respect the mature body. At this church, we say we are here to help you become fully engaged in Christ at church and on mission. And so this is what Paul's talking about, that level of maturity. That's where we're, we're driving towards. That's what our hope is. In every respect the mature body of him, Jesus, who is the head, that is Christ. So how do we do this? How do we speak Something that sets people free in love. It's not easy. In fact, Peter gave us further insight. Peter said this. He said, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. So the assumption is not if people ask you, but when people ask you. The assumption is, yes, through our actions, that how we serve one another, the hope that we have, the anticipation of what God is doing in us and through us and around us would lead other people to look at our lives and say, tell me about the hope that you have in Jesus. And that when that happens, we're prepared to give the reason for the hope that we have. We've already pre-decided. We're equipped we're looking forward to it. We wake up in the day and we say, okay, this is the day that you've given me, God. You've created it. You've ordained it. Years before I was even a thought in my parents' eye, mind, you, you existed and you had a plan and there's nothing by coincidence that's going to happen this day. And so as I give my day to you and as you bring people into my life, and I don't know what's going to happen because we know now more in this season more than ever that any day you just don't know what the day holds so that when God brings a situation an opportunity, you are prepared. But Peter doesn't stop here. He says that when we respond, that we would do this with gentleness and respect. My hope today is to have a conversation around a very important topic, which is to speak the truth in love. And as Peter said, to do this with gentleness and respect, because I don't know about you, but I find this hard. I find this very challenging. It's not easy. 
Growing up, uh, I enjoyed the game of baseball. Baseball was like my world. Uh, it was the thing that gave me purpose uh, to help me move forward in difficult seasons. What I appreciate about baseball is that there's not many things you can do in life and fail seven out of 10 times and make millions of dollars. <laughs> Think about it. In baseball, if I have a batting average of 300, I'm winning. But if I go to a restaurant seven times out of 10 and they fail, I'm not going back. If you're in, this, you're in the business of investing and you get it wrong seven out of 10 times, that's going to be a problem. And yet in difficult conversations around things that matter most, let's be honest, if we get it wrong seven out of 10 times, suddenly our marriage is not going to look what we would hope, uh, how we would hope them to look and how we would experience them, parenting, places of employment in terms of how we lead uh, those that um, are under our direction and how we follow those uh, that are leading us. You know, if you sit down in front of your boss and your boss is like, listen, it's not going so well, and you're thinking, well, I got it right three out of 10 times. I'm winning. This is not gonna go well. And at the same time, when, when God provides these unique opportunities to, to talk about the hope that we have in Jesus, and if we get it wrong seven out of 10 times, this is what's at stake, eternity. People's souls, what they're wrestling with. But I'll be honest, before I was a pastor, I was a barista. I made Starbucks beverages. And I got to interact with people all the time. And I got to tell you, I often felt ill-equipped to have difficult conversations, to speak truth in love, with gentleness and respect. So my hope today is by the end of this message, we'd walk away equipped to have conversations about matters that matter most, like this one. What do you do when you come across a picture like this? Like you, I've been praying for Ukraine. I've been praying for what's happening with Russia, and I've been praying for leaders in government. I've been praying for missionaries, people that are there strategically sharing the hope of Jesus during a very difficult time, people that have chosen to stay instead of flee because of what conversations might come about. And so like you, I'm on social media and I see a picture like this where a dad is saying goodbye to his daughter because he's going to stay and fight and the daughter's leaving. And internally, emotionally, I'm like, this is, this is wrong, this isn't right. But isn't it interesting that we can see what's happening and we say, something about this is, ah, this is awful. That's one side of us. But in my processing this week, one of the ways that I've been convicted is I've thought about what's happening in Ukraine is the selfishness within me. Because now you have conversations like, well, the gas prices are going up. And this is inconvenient. And yet people's lives are literally being blown up. And we're thinking... Well, you know, how much, when's four or five dollars a gallon? I mean, this is ridiculous. And overseas, people are thinking, am I going to just live another day? What's going to happen next? But as I, as I pulled back the layers and began to process what was happening in Ukraine, the thought came to mind, here's what's interesting. And this scares me a little bit. But when I think about the, a picture like this and internally we say, hey, this is wrong. There are those on the other side of the struggle that fundamentally believe that what they're doing is right. And so you have two sides that one would say, I'm in the right, and the other one would say, I'm in the right as well. And here's the tension that we all live in, and you know this. You don't even have to be a follower of Jesus to understand this tension, that when it comes to wrong and what's right and what's true and what's not, being wrong feels the same as being right. And this was the tension that years ago, religious leaders were living in. Jesus had uh, just got done praying, and one of the things that was common for Jesus was to get away and pray and to spend time before he would go and engage in very difficult ministry. And after he had got done praying, he regathered with a group of guys that he did life with. They slept in the same places. They, they shared the same meals. They, they breathed the same air. They had some of the, the same experiences. They were close. They were, they were tight. And so when Jesus regathered with this group of men that he had built memories with, that he had invested his life pouring into, and one of these guys, his name was Judas, shows up with some religious leaders and soldiers. 
And they have torches, lanterns, and weapons. Another one of these guys named Simon Peter instantly jumps to the defense of Jesus ready to strike. And when things settle down in that moment, after Jesus settles things down, he, he, he leaves with this group that came to have a conversation, I guess, with him. Really, it was a, an interrogation. And if you've, you've probably seen movies like I've seen movies where they, they take one, someone alongside in a, in a dark room and they physically assault them and, and try to get information out of them. And so Jesus, in this conversation, says, if I said something wrong, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? You see, Jesus' path to the cross in just a few weeks, we're going to gather and we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But Jesus' path to the cross was centered around a conversation of what is true and what is not true. You see, what's fascinating is that those that are interrogating Jesus, they were scholars. It's not like they didn't went to Sunday school or didn't have Bible study they hadn't studied the, no, they, had, they knew the prophecies, they knew the truth of the scriptures, they knew the description of the one that was coming in the Messiah, and yet they knew all of that, they had all of the information, and yet they were convinced that Jesus was not the Messiah. They were convinced that Jesus was wrong. And so they chose to take something that was true and something that was meant to set people free, and they began to manipulate it and distort it to get a desired outcome that they wanted. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever tried to manipulate a situation to get what you want? I have. It usually happens when I play the game Monopoly. <laughs> Seriously. How many of you enjoy the game of Monopoly? If you're not raising your hand, it's probably because you've played the game of Monopoly with someone like me. Uh, there are a lot of different versions of Monopoly. I found this this week. I told my wife, this Christmas, right here, this is what I want, the elf version of Monopoly. But here's the more important question. How many of you here today, or if you're at home online with the chat with Kristen, you might interact with her in this way. Um, how many of you, when you play the game of Monopoly, you start with money and free parking? Oh, yeah. Someone's don't, I saw someone going like, yes, of course. And so then what happens is you play the game uh, and you get like a community chess card and it says you need to pay a doctor's fill, bill or fee. So you put it in there. You know, maybe you land, you go to jail and you're like, okay, I got to go to jail. So I don't want to stay in there. So now I'm going to pay the 50 bucks and get out of jail and that goes in free parking. So then eventually you roll the dice and someone comes along and they land on free parking. And if you land on free parking and you play this way, boom, it's like you won the lottery. Like, I'm in the game again. I get to, to take all of the funds. Let me tell you, if you play the game this way, you are wrong, okay? You are absolutely wrong. That's not how you, if you read the rules, it is not in the rule book, okay? Now, you would say, well, Rob, it's a house rule. Okay, I know you're kind, house rules. You probably cut in the lunch line. You probably share your Netflix password with people that aren't your family. I know about house rules. But what's true about how we approach the game of Monopoly is it says something probably about how we approach life. And that many of us either drift towards a religious mindset in life or an irreligious mindset in life. You see, if you have a religious mindset in life, you're all about the rules. And rules are good. They're, they're meant to help us enjoy life in such a, a, a life-giving type of way. But sometimes, like myself, uh, you know the rules. It's like you're playing Monopoly and someone lands on your property. You're not exactly going to remind them that they now have to pay rent, even though you know the rules. Now you're using the rules to your advantage. Or you have an irreligious mindset, which is like, hey, life's just meant to be enjoyed, so I make up my own rules. I will if it's my will, is the thinking. And these were the two mindsets that were very present in this conversation with Jesus. And if we're honest, we can probably see which camp we drift in. But when it came to the conversation that Jesus was having, it wasn't a game. It was a matter of life and death. 
So here's what happens next. If I said something wrong, Jesus replies, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? You see, rather than lean in to Jesus' convicting and convincing question, they sought the help of an irreligious leader to do for them what they would not do themselves. So they gather with this man, this religious leader, this person of influence, and the question is, what charges are you bringing against this man? To which they reply, if he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. You see, what's true of you is not true of me. You have your rules and principles and standards, and I have my own rules and principles and standards. But they replied, but we, we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. And so you have one group that's trying to, to use the rules to their advantage, and then you have an irreligious leader that's saying, I, I don't know how I gain from this. I don't know how this, this benefits me. And so Pilate says, oh, it's Jesus, step into my office, let's have a conversation. What is it you've done, dude? <laughs> like, what's going on? Clearly these people are frustrated with you. What is happening? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest, but the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. See that there? My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. And then he says, but my, own, my kingdom is from another place. You see, up to this point, uh, Jesus was a threat to what was happening at the temple. But in this moment, now he's a threat to the throne. And so now Pilate says, hey, listen, now I see how I can step into the situation, appease the masses, and benefit myself. You say that I'm a king, Jesus says. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. You see, this whole conversation, this whole path to the cross leads around one important, compelling question. And and in just three simple words, a simple statement, Pilate asks something that we all ask at some point in our life. In fact, this is the question that shapes how you approach marriage, parenting, finances. And this is the question that shapes one of the most important questions we ever ask, which is what happens after we die? Tell me about life after death. Here's what Pilate said. What is truth. What is truth? You see, the answer to this question helps us decide matters that matter most and what matters most. But the answer to this question also shapes who matters most. Think about it. If my value as a human being is determined by everyone everywhere, then everyone, everywhere, can determine whose lives matter and whose lives don't. This week, I was uh, in between one appointment to the next, and I needed to stop and grab a bite to eat, and so because my diet's really healthy, I went to Wendy's. <laughs> and nobody sent me any emails about throwing Wendy's under the bus, okay? Listen, I needed a cheeseburger. It was there and convenient in that moment. And so I'm eating my cheeseburger in front of a pawn shop. The pawn shop was called Pawn King. And it was interesting. This gentleman got out of his car, and he had this briefcase box thing, and he put it down on the ground, and he looked at the box. And then he looked at his phone, and he picked up the box. He started to walk a couple steps forward, and then he put the box down, and he came back and looked at his phone. And he's clearly wrestling with something. And so now he goes into the pawn shop, and entering into the pawn shop, obviously you enter in with some sort of assessment of the value of this object. Like you've probably researched it, and you have an idea of what you think this is worth. But on the other side of the counter is someone that also has an opinion about what that object is worth. And now you're going to have a conversation about the value of this thing that you both say may or may not have value. And I share this because in life there are two options. 
either we're all pawn kings and we are determined who and what has value or we worship the one true king. And what has value and infinite worth is determined by him and him alone. So here are some common ways that we respond to this question. What is true? What is right? What is moral and what is not? For many people, it's through feelings. It just feels right. It feels right, so because I feel good about it, it it must be true. And this gets complicated if you're a Christian because if you follow after Jesus, you've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so at times in your season, some people might use the language, I felt a prompting by God to respond in this way. And I'm not saying that God can't lead in this way because I think that he does, and I've experienced this in my own life, but it's not the only thing that you should seek after. And you should always use it through the counsel of everything else, like his people, his word, his truth. God uses all of those things to bring about clarity. Because in my own life, I've made decisions where I've said it just felt right, but in that moment, I didn't have all the information. Some of the things that I, be- that I believed was not true. And so in that moment, what I was feeling was entirely real. It just wasn't valid because it was rooted in something that was not true. And so this can't be the sole way that we discern what is right and what is wrong because you look at what's happening in Ukraine and you would say that some would say this feels wrong and there are those on the other side of it that would say this is right. So here's another common approach. Right now I'm feeling insecure because my clickers aren't, isn't advancing. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> wish fulfillment. I want it to be true. I want it to be true. This week as a staff, we went through this really fun assessment. Uh, There's a book called uh, The Working Genius, The Six Types of Working Geniuses. It's by an author's name is Patrick Lencioni, and it helps you kind of identify the things that you thrive in and the things that maybe you shouldn't be doing. It's a great book, and so we did it as a staff. And, And one of these geniuses is this idea of galvanizing. And that there are people that are gifted at just rallying, inspiring people into action. And um, Trevin, our our worship leader, is definitely gifted in in galvanizing. I mean, we experience that through worship, his passion and saying, come on, let's go. We're worshiping Jesus. And I love that about the gift that God has, has given him in that way. I'm not wired in that way. But what I've also experienced in life, that the the adverse of that is sometimes we just think if we just muster up positivity, that we can manifest desired results into our life. That if I just think positive, and if I just will this into action, then then it must be true, and it's going to happen. Another way that we do this is through popularity. And this is probably the most prevalent way in in culture today, everyone believes it, so it must be true. So when I first started playing Monopoly with my wife, she was a free parking lady. Um, and so she believed that this is how you play the game because it was, that's how she was taught. That's what, how it was modeled to her. So obviously, you know, when you're playing with your parents, you trust your parents. Your parents would never lie to you. So, I mean, this is how you play the game of Monopoly. It's just passed down. It's just common practice. So it must be true. But there's another approach to truth. In fact, as we read through uh, Paul's letters to the church of Thessalonica, one of the things that he says is to test truth, that we should test it. So let me give you three questions that we can ask that I think are a better approach to testing truth and, and responding what Pilate said years ago. What is truth? Number one, is it logical? Is it logical? Let's use, let's use war as a case study since it's right there in real time for us. You know, what's interesting, uh, and I love this about our church, is that we're a, we're a multi-generational church. That's beautiful. From infants all the way up to people that, that are wise in their years. But it's true that some of you lived during a time, and you remember Duck and Cover. Or you heard the stories and showing up to school with fear and anxiety Some of you lived during a time of of the threat of the draft and you went through the draft and you remember the emotions and you just think about, are we heading back and that, is that going to be a part of of reality again? I mean, you know, so there's an instinct there because of your past. Some people uh, have lost loved ones because they serve our country. They served our country. And so there's, there's emotions there too. 
And so when you have conflict, intense conflict like what's happening in Ukraine and Russia, uh, people's emotions take over, and you get tweetable statements like this from a person of influence who said, uh, religion is the cause of all problems in the world. I don't believe in organized religion at all. It's what separates people. One religion just represents fragments. Represents fragments. It causes war. More people have died because of the religious conflict than, than because of religious conflict than any other reason. I shared this over a year ago. At face value, this argument makes sense. It's logical. It seems like, yeah, you know what? Religion divides. But uh, there's a great encyclopedia done by uh, Phillips and Axelrod, and they, Axelrod, they chronicled all of the, the wars in history, and what they found was that only 7% of wars were religiously motivated. And if you take uh, the, the thought and worldview of Islam out of that, it goes to 3.23%. So it seems logical, but it's not factual. The reality, what they found is that the number one cause of human suffering was not war. The number one cause for human suffering in the 20th century is political ideology. So we must not just ask, what is, is it logical? Or um, we must also ask, is it factual? And then the third one is, we must ask, is it livable? Is it livable? Is this truth livable? One of the the most prevalent, uh, prevailing uh, teachings during our time, it's coming out of a, what they call the prosperity movement. Uh, it's this belief that when it comes to the atonement, and we use that word atonement, it's a fancy word that means what happened on the cross through the blood of Jesus. See, some teach that yes, the atonement, the blood of Christ is what helps us make, uh, be right with God. But some add to that. Not only does it cover sin, but it also helps you when it comes to sickness, when it comes to illness, when it comes to poverty. And so the teaching is, is that if you have enough faith, if you really believe in Christ, if you follow after Jesus, then you will prosper. Here's the, here's the problem. Pastors, because of the age of internet and YouTube, see this, these preachings and in third world countries, they say, okay, this is working. Their church has like 20,000 people, so it must be true, right? And they take this same teaching and they apply it in their immediate context, and it does not work. Because statistically, if you're born in this country, you have access to another level of health care. Statistically, if you're born in this country, you have a good chance of being wealthy by the world's definition. But a good friend of mine says that when it comes to theology, when it comes to what's true, Here's what's, how we should approach it. If it's not true for people everywhere, it's not true for people anywhere. Is it logical? Is it factual? Is it livable? But here's the challenge. And I'm, I, I'm talking to myself. There's a resistance within me to go after what's true. Because I might discover things about myself that I'm uncomfortable with. And there's a resistance to go after what's true because sometimes when we engage truth, it leads us down conversations about culture, belief, religions, and worldview. And those are the things that you're not supposed to talk about at the dinner table. Those are the uncomfortable conversations in life. And this was the tension that Pilate found himself. It's like you wake up one day, and you know, I bet you it wasn't on his agenda to think this, I'm going to be deciding the fate of this one that many believe are the Messiah and some are not this real uncomfortable tension. And here's what happens next. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, beaten. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again, mocking him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. I'm not really sure if this guy's in the wrong, but you say he is, so you deal with it. To which the religious leaders said, we have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. 
Isn't it interesting how the truth has a way of coming out? Even if we try to hide it and conceal it, it has a way of coming to light. See, in this moment, the real motive for them bringing Jesus to Pilate was not his claim to be the king of Jews. It was his claim that he was the son of God. And that they would say, this was blasphemy. Again, they were fully convinced that they were right. You see, here's what happens in life. And I've discovered this to be true. Most people don't want to live a life that they know is false. But don't investigate to see if their beliefs are true. We don't want to live a lie. Nobody wakes up saying, I want to live in something that this is fundamentally wrong or, or not true. And yet it takes a whole lot of effort and discomfort to engage what is true and to ask the hard questions. And so I found these questions this week. And to be honest, this was a convicting week. I woke up on Monday thinking, okay, I'm going to have to write this message that I wasn't prepared. And then I start diving into what God is leading me towards and this conversation about truth and how do we process with Ukraine and Russia. And then I came across these questions and I thought, man, I don't know if I want to preach this message this week. I'm, this is too convicting for me personally. The first question is a softball. Here it is. Do you enjoy learning new things? Most people would say, Sure. I love watching, you know, uh, a talk or listening to a podcast or reading a book or entering into a conversation and finding out something that I didn't know to be true before. And I thought, yeah, I'm a learner. But then the next thought I had was, but isn't it true that we hate change? Because when you experience change, you have to learn something new. Here's the next one. Are you threatened by differing opinions? So I'm in a coffee shop. I like to write messages in coffee shops. And if you ever are in a coffee shop near me, know that I am listening to your conversation. <laughs> I eavesdrop. Because I learn a lot about humanity. And so this week, I'm, I'm listening to what everybody's concerned about. Everybody's concerned about inflation and gas prices. And people are concerned about what's happening in Ukraine. And I mean, it's just a common, everybody's engaging in these conversations. And then someone sits down and they start responding to the State of the Union address. And I kid you not, I'm in this section of my message, are you threatened by differing opinions? And I'm listening and the adrenaline's boiling. I disagree inside. I'm like, how could you think that? I'm not saying this to this person. But inside I am. Are you threatened by differing opinions? I think most of us probably are. Here's one more. And this fact makes it, this one, even more difficult. Do you have meaningful friendships with people who believe differently? I'm a pastor, so sometimes people call you, you're like a professional Christian, so like you, you get paid to do this, so like you have to do these sort of things. But what's true about pastors is most of the time we spend time with people that think the same, believe the same. Like uh, the people on my staff, we're, you know, for the most part, we're, you know, thinking and believing the same. And then and I come to church, and it's, we're gathered as, as Christians and, and, and believers, so this is hard for me, but you know what? Every time I uh, have conversations with family members, I'm reminded about how difficult this is. That to see and experience the world differently. But this is why Paul made such a big point about speaking the truth in love, and Peter said to do it with gentleness and respect because we are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So wherever we go, we carry the official position of heaven with us and his kingdom and what Jesus thinks about the situation. So it's not an option to not speak the truth. It's, yes, we want to live in such a way where people recognize the love of Jesus, but it's not just actions. It's also words and truth. And so I want to end today by giving you three simple things that I think we can all do to accomplish what Paul's saying, to speak the truth in love with gentleness and respect. Here's the first step. Ask more and say less. One question Pilate asked, what is 
truth. And that was the question I wrestled with all this week. You can say so much by one statement. You can say so much by asking a question. So in those moments when the soapbox there, and you're ready to pound your chest and say, this is what I believe, what if we took a different approach? Seek to understand before you seek to stand. Seek to understand before you seek to stand. Ask more and say less. Help me to understand why you think this way, why you respond this way. How do you know this to be true? Are you confident in this? What makes you so confident in this? Here's another question or another approach. Ask more or agree more and disagree less. What's interesting about humans is that the way that we engage relationally is through commonality. On a Sunday, if you meet someone new, you, you go into survey mode. Well, what part of town do you live in? Oh, well, what do you do for a living? Oh, what sports team do you follow? Oh, this is interesting. Oh, did you know so-and-so? And then you start to define all of these commonalities. The moment we get into a hard conversation, all those things go out the window. Suddenly, it's not about finding commonalities. It's all about pointing out the differences. It's like the game of whack-a-mole. You know this game? I love this show, Simpsons. Ready? Boom. I disagree. Boom. I disagree. Boom. We're watching the conversation. As soon as that point comes out, bam. Ready to drop the hammer. Here's one more step. And I think this is really a response to the gospel. Answer in love with grace and truth. You see, the gospel is the greatest strategy for speaking truth in love. Recently, I've been convicted by this. What if every time that you were gonna have a difficult conversation, you stopped and preached the gospel to yourself? You stopped and said, hey, here's what's true about me. Uh, I, there's this standard that God has and I don't live up to that standard and I fall short of that standard, so therefore I sin. And yet in Christ, I'm known, loved, and accepted. And so I have this dichotomy of I've experienced this hard truth, but I've also experienced this hope-filled grace. And so before I enter into this difficult conversation with someone, I'm going to remind myself who I am in Christ and who this person is. That they are made in God's image. That their life has value and meaning and God's hope for them is that they would grow in Christ. One of the ways that we see this is when Jesus arrives in a very difficult moment. You might recall the story, Lazarus is dead and he has two sisters that are grieving. And isn't it true that we all grieve differently? And took some time for Jesus to show up and Martha gets there and she's in Jesus's faith, face and she's mouthing off. And Jesus responds with a hard truth, but Mary Mary is so taken back. She's weeping. And so what did Jesus do? He wept. Grace and truth. If we're going to speak the truth in love with gentleness and respect, it starts with grace and truth. Now, I shared at the start of this message that I uh, enjoy the game of Monopoly. And here's the sad truth about me. Uh, I've only played Monopoly with my wife once. And it's when we were dating. And I don't even remember if we finished the game. Because three quarters of the way through, she said, this isn't fun. And I said, I'm not, there's only one reason why you play any game, and that's to win. That went over well. But in life, I think it's a balance of both because we want to win because we, we worship a God who is our heavenly father and we want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, but not at the expense of others along the way. I mean, you follow Jesus, but everybody else around you was miserable. That's not it. 
Jesus prayed that we would experience the full measure of joy in him. So it's both. So here's some good news. When it comes to truth, we can't change what's true, but what's true can change us. Truth is the, percep- is the perfect perception of reality. It's happening in that moment or it's happened in the past. But you can take that hard truth and it can transform you from the inside out. That what's true about you right now in this moment today doesn't also have to be true about you tomorrow and the day after. That when we have these hard conversations, speaking the truth and love, the motivation is that we become more and more like Christ. And so we respond in such a way where we're building one another up. There's so much language in the New Testament to build one another up, to be for one another. Ironing, sharpening, ironing, being more and more like Jesus, allowing the truth to us. Jesus said, set us free. That's what's at stake. Freedom. When we speak the truth in love with gentleness and respect, we are inviting people in to experience freedom, to be free from things that are not true and to be filled with things that are. Would you stand this morning if you're able?